Okay, we're going to call this special meeting to order. And I just want to say greetings to everyone and uh, call this uh, meeting. And Madam Clerk, I ask that uh, my letter of dated August 20th, 2020, calling for a special session, be made part of the record. And we will now commence with the meeting. Okay, and at this point, um, we're going to go to city manager's briefings and the interim financial statement. At this time, Alex Kelly is going to give an update on the city's finances. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Woods, city council members. Um, happy to come and present the preliminary FY 2020 results. As you know, we um, closed the books in July, June 30th for our financial statements, and then we prepare them uh, for the audit to be done by the end of November. Uh, we record revenue through August 14th, so we just finished closing the, the books on August 14th, and then we do analysis and prepare financial statements. And so as we're preparing those financial statements, we find revenues and expenditures that maybe are in the wrong fiscal year or need to be reclassified. So while I'm presenting these financial figures, they will change, not a whole lot, but they will change before we get the final results. So what I'd like to do is on slide one, slide two, um, this is our very um, abbreviated financial statement, revenues and expenditures budget to year to date. Our variance for revenues is 99.3%. Uh, so right now we have total revenues of 1.191 to the budget of 1199, so a variance of 7.9 million. For our expenditures, we have a variance of 115.7, and part of that is our transfer to schools, which we kept at the budget as 39 million, because we're still working on that. But our city expenditure, our city operations, has a variance of 76.7. On the next slide, we uh, kind of break down the revenue, whether what is over and under by category. Our real estate, personal property, business license, and general sales tax all came in slightly over budget. Hotel and meals, utility tax, other local taxes, and charges for services were all under budget. And then other revenues were slightly over budget. For other local taxes, uh, there's a telecommunication tax, uh, $1.7 million we need to accrue back from FY21 to FY20. So th this number will change slightly, uh, was changed by one point. Seven million. Uh, we just found that yesterday, and then um, charges for services uh, also has a, a smaller variant or bigger variance. Excuse me. Um, charges for services include libraries, aquarium, and convention center, all which had uh, were under budget. Libraries by two hundred thousand, aquariums by two point nine million, and convention center by half a million. For expenditures, our personnel costs, we had a hiring freeze this year. Uh, for the general fund, we were able to have a uh, over, under budget, excuse me, by 23.1 million, that includes salaries and benefits. Our other operating costs were under by 35 million, attributable to um, a procurement freeze, as well as non-spending for essential, or spending only for essentials, and we also, um, uh, reviewed all our encumbrances and, and released encumbrances that were not necessarily uh, essential to the operation. We have a lease payment to the Commonwealth for the aquarium parking lot, which uh, has been moved back and budgeted in FY21. Our debt service, we had $1.6 million savings, and then we had reserve for encumbrances of $13.7 million. Our unassigned general fund balance, and is our policy is to have it between 8 and 12 percent of the next year's revenues. And uh, right now, currently, the unassigned fund balance is at 13.5 percent, or 159 unassigned uh, fund balance. To keep in with our policy, that gives us a variance of between 20 and 60 million dollars. That um, our fund balance is a little bit higher than um, what typically the 8 to 12 percent would be. A little bit further explanation of our fund balance. 
As of June 30th, um, it was $252 million for the total fund balance. When you take out the reservations of uh, $93 million, that comes to the 159. million. Some of those reservations are non-spendable type items like inventories and loans, uh, restricted for specific use because of a governmental reason that uh, we have a 1.5 for community services. Then we also have committed reserves for uh, schools, carry forwards, um, human service electronic implementation, the CIP operating budget, uh, schools operating budget and CIP, and then the aquarium marsh and parking lease. And so that gives us about 13.5% fund balance. Our cash uh, is trending uh, similarly to 2019, and we um, had a large bond sale that also helped us uh, increase our cash reserves. For FY21, uh, this is the one that has changed significantly since uh, Friday's packet. When we looked at the local revenues, we, we had provided council the cash basis, um, so anything that we received in July, we put on our our, our um, statement. However, some of that cash was really attributable to revenues in FY20. So our local revenues right now for the month of July were 14.6, which is very typical of um, having a small revenue for the first month. And then expenditures were, expenditures fall more in line of 112th every year. So it, while it looks like we have a lot more expenses than revenues, that's, that's very typical. Uh, occurrence. The next slide is our July trustee taxes. I think um, Councilwoman Henley had asked about comparing last year's to this year's trustee taxes. Uh, June sales, so uh, trustee taxes typically are uh, you're assessed one month and you get them the next month. And so what we did is compared last year's to this year's. And so for hotel, meal, cigarette, amusement, which are considered trustee tax, we also included sales tax because that is also a volatile type uh, revenue in this environment. Um, you can see the variance. Now, of course, hotel, we had a, ho I'm sorry, hotel was 22% down. For meals tax, uh, we did have that meal tax holiday in May and June. And it uh, was a little bit challenging to predict what we were getting in because uh, we had changed some of our due dates. Um, so some of the remittances might have been for March and we were getting them in June and July. They also, we, um, some of the vendors could not change their POS systems for the two months and so they continued collecting the taxes. So you will see a small amount that we're receiving in uh, June and July for meal taxes. Uh, the next slide shows the assessments uh, versus um, uh, March through July of the trustee taxes. First slide was just July. Then this is kind of more of a historical what received in 2019 versus 2020 for hotel meals, admission, and general sales. And you could see there's a there's a, a large difference in July. The next slide is hotel and emissions and meal tax due dates. Uh, just as a reminder, we did change some of our due dates for these trustee taxes. That uh, no, We didn't change the due dates, but we changed the penalty when the penalties were incurred. And so um, that did have an impact on when our cash was coming in. As well as the meals tax obviously was um, uh, reduced to zero in May and June. And uh, the meals tax versus assessment, the collections versus assessment, um, in order to line these up a little bit easier, what we did is uh, we collected the, the, in the month we collected, we showed the assessment. So if we collected it in January, we were showing the December assessment. So it shows the, the collection versus the assessment of that month. And so uh, obviously in March and April, there was some, some lag there, but then it started uh, aligning a little bit more with the assessments in the next month for meals tax. Hotel tax, uh, we did have two or three months where the assessments were much larger than the actual collection, but then you see touring, starting in June, we started collecting a little bit more than really what was assessed. 
This next slide shows the ho hotel occupancy rates. I got this, um, we received this from the Convention Visitors Bureau newsletter. Um, and it shows the last year versus this year. That was not in your first package on Friday, but it does show that um, the occupancy rate for hotels week by week uh, has improved significantly in June. And then another uh, tax, admission tax, is a trustee tax and tickets to events. And that actually is obviously the assessments versus the collections are close but has decreased over the course of the past few months. So in summary, the cash balances for all our funds are at appropriate level. Our revenues for 2020 was lower than our budget by 7.9, but as I said, we found 1.5 million, 1.6 million that should be in FY20, so that'll go down slightly. Um, we had expenditure savings that occurred for our salaries. We were very conservative in our spending. We reduced encumbrances. We eliminated all but non essential all, all limited all but not all essential spendings, excuse me. We did have CARES Act funding that we were able to move our expenditures over uh, out of the expense account into a grant account for uh, $3 million and then uh, for general fund, excuse me. And then for schools, um, we have a true up estimate of under $3 million. We're not finalized with that until we finalize our revenues and expenditures. And the re pre preliminary revision is $39 million for schools. Um, our July trustee revenues based on June sales were significantly lower than FY 2020. And our next steps is uh, next week we'll have a CARES Act presentation for the final 39 tranche that we received uh, from the, the state. And then we will do a uh, August update on September 15th. We'll provide July and August numbers and we also will do more finalized numbers on the preliminary FY 2020. And then on October 20th, we should have the final version of our uh, audit, very close to our audited financial statements. And then we'll present the final on December 8th. Thank you. Uh, thank you, any questions? John. I asked a number of questions by email and I just would like to have them considered as if I asked them here in reference to people's time and if the answers be put into the record and shared with all members of council if there's no objection. But I only have one question today because it was new information. I heard you say that a number of, of entities collected and levied the sales tax, meal tax because they couldn't update their systems to reflect that there was no meal tax. Is that correct? Um, some of them have. Now, when that some of it's just timing, but some of it they did not, they, they continued to collect the okay. taxes. Now, my question is when those taxes were collected, were they remitted to us or were they retained by the business? No, they, that's why we were receiving them as revenues. So they were collected by the city that, that I know of. I think the treasurer is going to go back and, and take a look at the, the well, my, differences. My question, Mr. Mayor, is our intention was not to levy the meal tax on the businesses. Uh, because we are trying to generate business, so we weren't looking to collect them. Obviously, the people that paid them thought they were paying taxes, but I'm just curious, since we had suspended the tax and we weren't collecting it, and I've laid it for later discussion, should we not just rebate the revenues back to the businesses since we said we weren't collecting it? I'm just trying to understand you know, and made us for another discussion. I don't want to do it all here today. Maybe the city attorney and people can come back and talk to us, but Thank I'm just you. curious about the status of taxes that we said weren't levied, but that were collected. Okay, Mr. Stiles and then Mr. Wood. My recollection, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Moss, is that the ordinance that you passed specifically said that if a business collected the taxes, they must remit them to the city. I, I do recall that. That's why I'm asking, and I, but we didn't anticipate, I think, this volume. I'm just wanting to make sure that the council is cognizant of, the, of that fact, and is that something that we really want to consciously do or not? Mr. Wood? Yeah, and just, just following up on, on that, um, I had a couple of people call me saying, hey, I went to such and such place and they, they still collected tax. And as it turns out, apparently some of the the larger national organizations weren't flexible enough with their systems and they just chose to do it because I had, I had made a call to um, 
to the treasurer and asked her about that, and she had said, yeah, they're, they were still remitting them. So. I'm fine, Mr. Mayor, with staying with the policy. I just wanted to make sure it was a conscious that we knew that that had happened. And I'm, I am surprised about the volume, you know, but I saw the number in there. I was surprised it didn't say zero. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Tower. I'd like to ask uh, Alice a question, but, but while uh, Mr. Moss's issue, would, if we were to remit those taxes to the, the business that collected them, would that not put them at an advantage as to others who had remitted, who had did, did not collect the tax? They, I mean, it's really the, it's the consumer that paid that tax, right? That is correct but you could make a case both ways. But I think if we're going to get into the competitive business, I have lots of issues which I would like to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my question was about the schools, and this, this is old, old school, if you'll pardon the expression, House, but the $39 million for the reversion, is, sure. could you put that in context for me, what sure. a typical number is for that? So as, as the city has... Uh, spent less money than their revenues, that's, that's the um, school reversion number. Right. And so until we get the final audited number from the schools, we don't know what that exact number is. Yeah, my question is, how does that compare to a typical year? Um, it's a little bit higher than a typical year. A little year. higher than a typical yeah, it's, year. It's actually quite higher than a typical year. Usually and, it's about between 15 and 22 million. And when will we deal with that reversion? Uh, usually by the October timeframe, okay. September, All right. October. Thank you very much. But if I could, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Tower, you are very astute in your observation. It is a substantially higher, and, and I think when the time comes, we, we need to look at what they're looking for forward, and since it is so unusual and why it happened, I think it is an opportunity in one of those joint meetings, Mr. Mayor, with the school board or maybe in the school board committee to discuss just because it has been the policy, giving the, it's about 30% higher than normal, that is that the right answer in light of the circumstances we're in? I think you raise an excellent point for a discussion, but uh, very astute observation. Yeah, I just say that uh, you know we do want to have more frequent meetings with the school board, and this would be an ideal topic to talk about. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Alice, for your report. Um, on page five on the unassigned general fund balance, um, typically you say we should have between eight to 11 percent on our general um, fund balance. We had 13.5. Um, did I hear you correctly? You say it's 20 to 20 to 40 million dollars higher? Uh, between 20 and 60 million dollars. And 60 million. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And, oh, I'm sorry. No, you, you can continue. Well, you know, you ha we have to take into consideration the budget for the next year and how All much right. we've held back. So it's a good cushion. Well, I'm just, in my observation, looking at, um, all the way back to 2011, this is the highest it's, it's ever been. Yes. Wow. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It, uh, I think the numbers are a little better than um, projected, and I think Very we're uh, trending in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, the planning department is going to come and give an update to the council on the pending planning items. Good afternoon, Mayor, Members of Council. Uh, Bill Landfair and I will give you a uh, real brief summary of all the items you will hear in September. Uh, I will start off with the September 1st meeting. Uh, this meeting will feature all short-term rentals. There will be 10 of them. Of these 10, seven are in the Beach District, one in the Bayside, one in, uh, two in Lynn Haven. All but one of these were recommended for approval, uh, and I will get into details of that. Throughout the first item is a short-term rental for a single-family home located in the Cypress Point neighborhood in the Bayside District. This was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission and was placed on the consent agenda. 
the home itself has four bedrooms. Uh, all four parking spaces are provided on site. Two are in the driveway and one, uh, two are in the garage. I will note the applicant has agreed to the maximum occupancy of eight guests and one rental contract per night. Uh, if you will see on the next slide that this is not an area of the city where short-term rentals are common. There are no other registered or approved short-term rentals in that neighborhood. Uh, you know, looking at host compliance, this house is uh, currently advertised. It has been rented in the last week uh, and is registered. The second item is a short-term rental request for a single-family home located in the Lynn Haven District. Uh, this was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission by a six to three vote. Uh, the discussion at planning commission was centered around the number of short-term rentals in the immediate area. The home is three bedrooms. Uh, all three parking spaces are required on site in the driveway in front of the home. The applicant has agreed to the new conditions. Uh, this is an area of the city where short-term rental use is common. There are 17 other registered properties in close proximity. The property is currently not uh, advertised on any platform uh, or is not registered with our Commissioner of Revenue yet. The third item is a uh, request for a single-family home built in 2019 located in the Lynn Haven District. Uh, this was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission and was placed on the consent agenda. Uh, it was heard in city council in May, if it looks familiar. Um, Councilman uh, Wood, I believe, had a conversation about a proposed reduction in the number of bedrooms and there were concerns about the size of the garage. Uh, the applicant was not agreeable uh, to reducing the number of bedrooms uh, and we'll speak to that when this, uh, when this is heard. The home is three bedrooms. Uh, the applicant has agreed to the changing conditions uh, of two per bedroom and one rental contract per week. Uh, as you can see up on the, the slide, there's that garage where the discussion was whether or not that could uh, reasonably fit a automobile. Uh, it is in an area of the city where short-term rental use is not common. There is only one other registered property in close proximity. Uh, the property is currently not being advertised uh, or is not registered. The fourth item is a short-term rental request for one unit of a duplex that was constructed in 1979. This was recommended for approval by staff and denial by planning commission with a vote of five to four. The denial was based on two factors. One, a uh, speaker that came to the uh, planning commission meeting and concerns over parking which you will see on the next slide, uh, that is in the right of way. It is a two bedroom unit. Uh, both of them are, so four total spaces are required on site. The two parking spaces for this unit were stacked. One is located on the driveway and one was uh, completely in the right of way. The applicant was agreeable to a maximum occupancy of four overnight guests and uh, one rental contract per seven days. However, would like to speak to those uh, at the hearing. This is an area of the city where uh, short-term rental use is uh, relatively common. There are seven registered uh, short-term rentals, one approved and two under review in the direct area. The property is currently being advertised uh, and has been rented in the past week. It is registered uh, with our Commissioner of Revenue. The fifth item is short-term rental request for a single family uh, located in the Croatan neighborhood. This was recommended for approval by both staff and planning commission. The home is four bedrooms. All four parking spaces are provided on site. Three are in the driveway, one in the garage. The applicant is uh, amenable to the new conditions of occupancy and number of rental contracts. Uh, the Croatan, there are several short-term rentals in that neighborhood. Uh, specifically, there are 20 registered short-term rentals and one is under review. Uh, this property is not currently being advertised and has not registered uh, yet. They are awaiting approval. Items six and seven are a uh, request for both units of a duplex located in the Beach District, uh, specifically uh, in the Vibe District. The site contains two dwellings and a noodle restaurant. Uh, it was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission and was placed on the consent agenda. 
Uh, both units of the duplex are one bedroom. Uh, both uh, required spaces are provided on site uh, right off 18th Street. As you can see by the site plan, the duplex sits in the rear of the site and there is a restaurant at the front of the site. As I mentioned, a noodle restaurant. The applicant is agreeable to the change of conditions. Uh, this is an area where there are a uh, plethora of short-term rentals. 45 are registered in the area, 18 under review, and one uh, approved. This short-term rental is currently being advertised, has been rented in the last seven days, uh, and is registered with our Commissioner of Revenue. Items eight and nine uh, are short-term rental requests for uh, the properties next door to the previous item. The site also contains two dwellings. It was recommended for approval by Staff and Planning Commission. Uh, the only real difference between this and the previous application is that um, the number of bedrooms, Unit A has two bedrooms, Unit B one bedroom for a total of three bedrooms, three required spaces. The applicant is uh, agreeable to the new conditions. Um, and as previously uh, shown, this is an area where short-term rentals are common. It, uh, this property is not currently uh, advertised. It has been used as a short-term rental in the past year, but they have withdrawn and have not um, recently uh, used it as such. The last short-term rental on the September 1st agenda is a request for one unit of a duplex located in the Beach District. Uh, it was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission on a 9-0 vote. It was not on the consent agenda as there was a discussion about two other short-term rentals within the same block as this uh, request. The unit itself is three bedrooms. Uh, all three spaces are provided on site, two in the driveway and one in the garage. The applicant is agreeable to the new conditions. Uh, it is an area of the city where short-term rental use is common. There are 35 registered short-term rentals, seven are under review, uh, and two are already approved uh, in the neighborhood. This short-term rental is currently advertised, uh, has not been used recently. Once this application was applied for, they ceased using it as a short-term rental, but within the past six months it has been used. They are also registered with the Commissioner of Revenue. And that wraps up the September 1st agenda. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. We have 19 items scheduled for September 8th. We've previously briefed you on these items, and they were initially heard by the City Council on July 21st and July 28th. We'll be happy to brief you again on these items or if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll move straight on to the agenda for September 15th. Okay. Any questions at all about uh, the first set? Okay. You can proceed. Thank you, sir. For September 15th, we've got 16 items. Six planning items, five short-term rentals, and four ordinances. First item, item one, is a request for a conditional use permit for a body piercing establishment located in the Rose Hall District on Independence Boulevard. This property is adjacent to Mount Trashmore. This conditional use permit will permit a body piercing establishment within an existing tattoo parlor which was originally approved by the City Council back in 2010. It will be located within an existing building, no exterior changes or signage is proposed, and there is no known opposition. Items two and three, properties, alleyways located between 75th and 76th Street, request for street closure in the Lynn Haven District. 18 adjoining property owners are requesting to close the majority of a 10 foot by 400 foot unimproved alley, totaling approximately 3,800 square feet. James T. Cromwell has been appointed by the court to act as receiver on behalf of a defunct company that owns the underlying fee for the alley and lanes. 
Two other smaller lanes also proposed to be closed, as shown on the survey exhibit. Lane A and B total 2,700 square feet. The total area to be closed is 6,500 square feet and will be incorporated into the adjacent residential lots. A viewers meeting was held to consider the requests and determine that the proposed closures will not result in any public inconvenience. The alley and lanes do not provide pedestrian or vehicle access and there are no public utilities located within them. There is no known opposition. Yeah, yes, Mr. Moss. Within the past on street closures, when you said utilities, did anyone make sure the assessment that no easements would be necessary in the future relative to any drainage issues? There is a, a condition. There is a condition to accommodate future drainage easement within the uh, street closures. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Item four. This is a request for a modification of conditions to a motor vehicle sales and service facility located on Bonnie Road in the Linhaven District. The applicant is seeking a modification of conditions to permit a prefabricated metal building for detailing vehicles. This is an after the fact request. As a result of an oversight by the manager of the business, the building was constructed without benefit of a building permit or modification to the underlying conditional use permit. As soon as the owner realized this mistake, he promptly contacted staff to file this application. The structure is similar in color and design to the nearby auto sales building, and there is no known opposition. Item five is a request for a conditional use permit for housing for seniors and disabled persons located on Virginia Beach Boulevard in the Rosemont SGA. The proposed 150-unit senior housing facility is in conformance with the recommendations of the Rosemont SGA, which calls for a mix of uses along this corridor and specifically recommends a four-story housing specifically for this site. As the housing will be age-restricted to persons 62 years of age or older, a conditional use permit for housing for seniors and disabled persons is requested. The applicant has worked with staff and the community to make adjustments to the site layout, which everyone could support. These revisions included flipping the building to reduce the building mass from the view of residents to the east and increasing the landscape buffer to the north, further buffering the single family homes located to the north. This plan meets the Rosemont SGA criteria and there is no known opposition. Item six is a request for modification of conditions for a borrow pit for property located on Princess Anne Road adjacent to the boundary with North Carolina. Excavation of sand has been an ongoing operation on this property since the 1970s. At this time, the applicant is seeking a modification of conditions to permit the operations to continue for another 10 years to June 2030, as the current permit expires this year. No other changes are proposed to the operations. A citizen spoke in opposition at the Planning Commission hearing, noting general concerns related to flooding, well contamination, and traffic. Are there any questions? Any questions? Well, well I could, Mr. Mayor. Will the record, because we dealt with this issue in some other cases with borough pits about well contamination, you may recall Mr. Mayor appears here, was around the Lent Oceana area at one time. So will we get the science and the scientific engineering studies as part of the record that we have that deal with this and will all those details be addressed? Uh, what we can provide, we can, we've been in contact with the State Bureau of Mines. Uh, there was extensive, and they, uh, provided a clean record. Uh, the property is periodically monitored, particularly for well contamination. Um, over the years, uh, the record has been very good in terms of the operations. There was extensive testimony at the Planning Commission hearing uh, from the applicant's representative uh, about uh, just what they do in terms of testing to ensure that there's no adverse effect on the surrounding neighborhood and we can provide that verbatim as part of the ARF for you as well. But if I remember correctly, they are, they are, have to indemnify other people in the event that their water is impacted, they're financially liable. I'd have to verify that, sir. We'll confirm that for All you. All right, thank you very much. Yes. 
Okay, anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. it. Appreciate it. All righty, we will now move on to council comments. Yes, uh, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have shared this with uh, most everybody. Vice Mayor, I'm sorry, they weren't finished with their presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, I know how much you love short-term rentals, so I have a few more if you'd like to oh, hear Oh, okay, that. my apologies. <laughs> um, I'll go through them briefly. We have uh, six short-term rentals on this agenda, including uh, also the four proposed ordinance amendments that uh, Councilman Tower has brought forward, so I will briefly go through these. Uh, item seven is a short-term rental for a single-family home in the Croatan uh, neighborhood. It was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission on a 9-0 to vote. Home is four bedroom. All four parking spaces are provided on site, three in the driveway and one in the garage. Uh, there are several other short-term rentals in the neighborhood. 16 are registered and two are under review. The property is currently not being advertised or used as a short-term rental. Items eight and nine are short-term rental requests for both units of a duplex in the Lakewood subdivision of the Beach District. It was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission and placed on the consent agenda. Both units are two bedroom. All four spaces are provided on site. Uh, located in the driveway in front of the uh, dwelling. There are uh, many short-term rentals in the neighborhood. There are 37 registered, eight under review, and two CUPs already approved uh, within the neighborhood. The property is currently not being advertised or used as a short-term rental. Item 10 is a short-term rental request for a single-family home uh, in the Princess Anne Plaza neighborhood. This was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission with a six to two vote. Uh, there was a discussion at planning commission over the needed uh, parking area. The current driveway is slightly too thin to uh, accommodate the three parking spaces required for this three bedroom. The proposal is to add a three foot wide uh, strip of gravel um, to accommodate this uh, last parking space. Uh, there are not many registered short-term rentals in this area. There is only one. The property is currently not advertised. It was advertised when this application was submitted, but since submitting to us, they have pulled it off and have not used it as a short-term rental. Uh, item 11 is a request for a townhome located in the Centerville District. This was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission by eight to zero vote on the consent agenda. It is a two-bedroom townhome. Both uh, parking spaces are provided in the driveway area in front of the townhome. It is an area city where there are no registered or under uh, other short-term rentals under review. It is currently not being used as a short-term rental uh, or has not been rented uh, recently. Uh, item 12 is a request for a short-term rental for a semi-detached dwelling located in the Kempsville District. This was recommended for approval by staff and planning commission by eight to zero vote on the consent agenda. It is a four bedroom home. All four parking spaces are provided in the driveway in front of the home. Uh, two of the spaces overhang into the right of way, uh, but because they do not block vehicular or uh, pedestrian traffic, uh, staff recommended approval. This is an area uh, where short-term rentals is not common. There is only one other registered short-term rental in close proximity. This property has been uh, used as a short-term rental, has been rented in the past week, and is currently advertised and registered. Um, item 13 is the first of the four amendments brought forth uh, by Councilman Tower. It is an ordinance to amend section 104 to allow civil penalties for the violation of uh, short-term rentals. Currently, this is a criminal penalty. What civil penalties will allow the zoning office to do is um, issue monetary fines, think more along the lines of a parking ticket. It will ease uh, enforcement abilities. You can see it's a $200 penalty for the initial summons and $500 uh, penalty for each additional. Question? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Kevin, how, um, how quickly can those be issued? Uh, those can be issued on 
on the spot if we see that violation. And is, can they be issued multiple times for the same Yes, absolutely. Complaint? Absolutely. And the way it works is it would get issued, the people could um, pay the fine, or they could contest the fine and go through the court process. As it stands right now, uh, being a criminal uh, violation, there is that notice of violation, the appeal period, and then through the court system uh, in order to get any kind of uh, fine as a penalty. Just for my clarification, so if we cite somebody for, let's just say, having a party that they're not allowed to have, and then three days later there's new tenants and they do the same thing, we're not, they can be cited for each occurrence? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And we will track, uh, you know, track these sightings, uh, you know, so we will know what, th these sightings will link to the property. So we will know how many are on each property to allow us to identify problem properties. Okay. And after the $500 fine, it's just $500 indefinitely? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, and then at, you know, a certain point, we would find the problem property. We would uh, pursue, I imagine, bringing it back in front of you to revoke the conditional use permit. So that was going to be my next question. So let's say this gives us the ability to document a history is the other part of this, right? Like, because we'll be able to yes. say we already cited you X amount of times for this problem. So then that would come back to us to be um, revoted on, I guess, right? Yes, you have the ability to revoke the conditional use permit. Okay, thank in you. Which, well, in which case, if they continue to operate as a short-term rental, that in itself would be a violation. When, um, w at what point do you anticipate bringing that back to us after how many penalties? Um, we do not have a hard and fast number. Um, you know, we had spoken, when this all went through the process, we had talked about you know, uh, stuff like three strikes, that tort, uh, type of system. However, there's different degrees to violations. Um, you know, I think that there is a difference between someone who leaves trash on the curb, you know, three times versus someone who has a party where there's, uh, you know, criminal activity. I think we look at that differently, how it impacts the neighborhood differently. So at this point, uh, it still is a judgment call. I think it would be helpful in the future if we had kind of a rubric for how we intended on evaluating these things. My concern is that if we have a continual repeat offender, but that's based on somebody's interpretation, because um, we all see them a little differently. I mean, this body sees short-term rentals a little differently. Absolutely. So I'm, I would like, I think it would be helpful if we had a you know, I agree the trash thing's probably not as, should not be looked at so severely, but if we have somebody who's constantly renting to people that are disru disrupting, actively disrupting the neighborhood, then that has a different levity to it. So I would, it would be helpful for me if we had some kind of uh, grading policy in terms of generally what can we as council expect to hear back from if so many citations of this variety are issued. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. We've got... You got more? Okay. Three, three more ordinances. There we the, go. The next one is uh, the ordinance pertaining to the revocation of grandfather status and the city council findings. Uh, what this proposed ordinance would do is after two years of inactivity as a short-term rental, the planning director would have the ability to revoke any grandfather status. Uh, the second is the required findings, which are four um, findings onto which Planning Commission staff and council could evaluate short-term rentals. Um, at Planning Commission, the grandfathered uh, portion of this amendment was, um, you know, talked about favorably. However, this uh, ordinance was recommended for denial uh, with a four-to-four -four vote. Uh, the required findings, there were two motions. The first one was to get rid of uh, numbers one and four, which is the required finding on the density of short-term rentals in the immediate area, and number four uh, being that they are a valued uh, resource in this city. Planning Commission recommended eliminating one and four. That motion failed on a four to four vote. Uh, another motion was filed. Um, actually with the grandfathering, which changed the grandfathering uh, time period from two years to five years, where if inactivity after five, that motion also failed on a four to four vote. So this uh, ordinance comes before you as a recommendation of denial from Planning Commission. 
The third ordinance uh, is in regard to the Old Beach overlay and permitting short-term rentals as a principal use in certain areas. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended properties east of Baltic Avenue and properties with frontage on Baltic Avenue are permitted by right if they meet the requirements of the ordinance. Properties west of Baltic are permitted by right um, uh, and they are the primary residence. So, Basically, the first ordinance came forward saying you have, it has to be your principal residence to have a short-term rental. What uh, Planning Commission uh, discussed and ended up bringing forward, which you can see on this map here, oh, kind of, is properties east of Baltic. You just have to meet the requirements. It does not have to be your principal residence. Properties west of Baltic, that principal residence requirement remains in place. And that is how they are bringing it forward. Uh, to you. And then the last uh, proposed amendment are just the transition rules as to when this, uh, these ordinances would take place, and that is just that they will be effective immediately upon any city council approval. Are there any questions? I'd any questions at all? Mr. Moss. At a, at a later meeting, I'd like to have a, a discussion maybe with the city attorney relative to legal definition of principal residence what that means and our ability to enforce whatever legally that means. Some of these things are corporations. Can a corporation are legally considered a person? So can a corporation have a principal residence? So I'm, I'm uncertain as to what that means. And, and I, I'd just like to have a future time, Mr. Mayor, discussion to eliminate any ambiguity, and I'm sure the staff would appreciate that. Yeah, I think that would be a very valuable conversation. Our zoning ordinance just defines principal residence as living there 50% or more of the time. So you're talking that 183 days. Uh, but I do think that would be a valuable conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that conversation would, you know, should occur. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you got it. Okay, Mr. Wood. Council comments. Sorry, I jumped the gun before. Pass this down. Probably take one and pass it down. Um, as, as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, former EMS Chief Bruce Edwards passed away um, last week, and uh, the, the services are starting up um, Friday and Saturday, and because of COVID, there's not a whole lot of, of stuff that's going on. But one thing that, um, because of the 42 years of service that, that Chief Edwards gave to EMS and, and the impact on the volunteer system and the career system. I've, I've got a resolution here that I'd like to have uh, the council to agree to put on the agenda tonight, renaming the Virginia Beach Emergency Medical Services Headquarters and Training Center as a Bruce W. Edwards Virginia Beach EMS Center. So uh, if, if, does, if anybody doesn't have, if anybody has a problem with that, if you let me know, otherwise I'd, uh, at the appropriate time, I'd like to move to add it to the agenda. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wood. Anybody else for council comments? Mr. Moss. Two. One, I wanted just to address the real estate assessor's report we got on new construction. First of all, it was a great report and a lot of good news. But I thought it was worth noting that there were 234 condo and single-family homes that were added during the quarter. But of those, uh, close to about 114 of those were homes under 350000 so I know we talk about affordable homes and whoever thought 350 would consider it affordable. It is, it is important to note that only 29 were under two, were 250 or under. And I thought the other good news was that the talking with the assessor is that at completion, which is not far away from its full assessment, the Marriott Hotel will be about $101 million and the Pearl Marina apartments will be the highest per apartment assessments in the city at completion. So when you look at this report, there's some really robust valuations uh, expending our uh, tax base. And I just thought it was wor worth recognizing. And I just want to follow up because I know tonight we are voting on the resolution about Atlantic Avenue and all the things that we need to do, which I'm fully in support of. But I hope to bring back in the near future a resolution of equal sense of urgency, which is a much more aggressive approach to our flooding problems in the city. That cannot be taking a back burner, and we need to be moving out on that just as smartly. I know everybody thinks that, but I just want to give you a heads up. I will be pursuing that, and I will hopefully have your support. Thank you very much. Yeah, I concur with that priority. Anybody else for council comments? 
Okay, Mr. Wood, can we uh, go on to um, your uh, uh, consent agenda? Sure. Um, and just so I can clarify, with respect to the planning items, we're going to determine that once the planning commission is here, correct? That's correct, sir. Okay, so we won't be doing that. So then under ordinances and resolutions, we have speakers on item two. Um, no other speakers on items. Does anybody want to pull any of these? No, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could please. Yes. I'll be voting no on item three. I do have a five-page letter, which I'd like to submit into the record as to my reasoning. I have no intention of reading it, but I am planning on voting no and would like my letter entered into the record. Okay, thank you very much. So we're just uh, going to pull item two. So everybody's okay with items one and three then? Okay. okay. And that's it for now, correct? Yes, sir. That's it. Okay. Um, at this point, okay, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from the open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Personnel matters, discussion, considerations, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body pursuant to Section 2.237A7, and that is in regard to council appointments, council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, Agencies and appointees, do I have a motion? Second. A motion and a second. Madam Clerk? Councilmember Abbott? Aye. Councilmember Rolucci? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember Moss? Aye. Councilmember Rouse? Aye. Councilmember Tower? Aye. Councilmember Wilson? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wood? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. 11 to 0. Okay, thank you very much. At this point, uh, we will adjourn to go up upstairs to the uh, uh, executive session. Thank you.
Okay, council members, if we can convene. Okay, at this point, we're going to reconvene to certify the closed session. Okay, do I have a motion? Second. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to certify the executive session. Uh, could we have uh, Madam Clerk? Councilmember Abbott? Aye. Councilmember Berlucci? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember Moss? Aye. Councilmember Rouse? Uh, Councilmember Tower? Aye. Councilmember Wilson? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wood? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. By a vote of 10 to 0, you have certified the closed session to be in accordance with the motion to recess. Okay, at this point, I'm going to adjourn the, uh, you know, the informal session, and uh, we will start the formal session at 6 o'clock. So moved.